Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Conversations. I'm Muhtadar Khan, your host. And today uh, I will be finishing or completing uh, the Ramadan 2024 special series of Conversations on classic books of Islamic civilization. And today I'm going to talk to you about Al Biruni's India. Al Biruni was from Khawarizmi in today's Uzbekistan. And he was a very prominent scientist, scholar philosopher, mathematician. I will talk a lot about him uh, soon, but this is the book that I have chosen to talk about in this Ramadan, Al-Biruni's India. It is also known as Tariq fil Hind or Tahkhikh Ma'lil Hind in Arabic. And it is a fantastic book uh, that he wrote over a period of 13 years from 10,000, from 1017 to 1030. So roughly about a thousand years ago, it's amazing. And I will share some parts of the book with you. So you will get an idea of what an incredible book this is. But before that, I have to do some office work. Uh, I want to especially thank uh, the Islamic Community Center of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, who are co-hosting this series. So thank you very much for your support. I also want to thank two doctors, Dr. Raza Khan and Dr. Wasim Khan for supporting these conversations. Uh, but before I start talking about who Al Biruni was and what this book is all about, please subscribe to Conversations if you have not already done so. Like this video, press the bell icon, and don't forget to share this with all of you. We are close to the end of Ramadan. I hope that you had a spiritually and uh, religiously enriching month, brought you closer to God, brought, brought you closer to yourself. Uh, and so I also want to wish all of you a happy Eid in advance. Uh, Eid is in three or four days, inshallah. So let's begin. Al-Biruni is from, was from a town uh, which is now renamed as Al-Biruni after him. It is in Uzbekistan. It was in those days uh, called Khawarizm. Uh, and uh, there was at least 200 years before him a very famous Muslim Central Asian uh, mathematician called Al Khawarizmi, uh, who, who, who hailed from that particular town. He actually wrote a famous book called Al Jabr on Mathematics, from which we get the word alge algebra. And also the word algorithm also comes from Al Khawarizmi. So it is from that town that Al Biruni came and he lived there. And he studied, he, he was interested in astronomy, he was a mathematician interested in trigonometry as well as uh, algebra. He was also a historian and he was keenly interested in Islamic philosophy. Uh, in fact, one of the most interesting aspects of his life was his ongoing uh, debate with the famous uh, uh, Islamic philosopher, Dr. Uh, Avicenna or Ibn Sina. Uh, they disputed over uh, the nature of the universe. Uh, apparently, at least from what I gathered from Al-Biruni, is that Ibn Sina believed uh, that uh, the creation was timeless, whereas Al-Biruni believed in the text of the Quran that, uh, that the whole creation was created from nothing. Uh, so it was a debate about whether whether things existed, whether time uh, existed all the time, or was time also created. So that was the debate uh, that Al-Biruni was having with Ibn Sina, and so they wrote letters to each other. Uh, so I'm curious now, I've not seen those letters, but I will uh, go look for them, and when I do, I will probably share with you on conversations. So some of the things that Al-Biruni is famous for is one of the things that he did, which was incredible, is he calculated the radius of the earth and uh, his, his accuracy was close to one to two percent. And that is absolutely fantastic. And he did it with in a very simple and geometric uh, <laughs> and geometry and trigonometry. And I'll show you how he did it very quickly. Uh, he also did something incredible. He predicted the existence of the Americas. He argued that between Europe and Asia in this in the Atlantic Ocean, there must be a large landmass. There just can't be an ocean from Europe all the way to Asia. Uh, and so he kind of predicted that there must be Americas, which I found quite interesting. 
uh, he was also uh, very keen in terms of engaging with Greek philosophy. And so when he came to India, he learned Sanskrit. And he also engaged with uh, Hindu scholars in India, Hindu philosophers in India. He was a very keen student of uh, Indian philosophy. He spent 13 years in India. He translated uh, two books from Sanskrit to Arabic, Samakya and Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. Uh, and what is interesting is in his book, which is which we will call uh, Al-Biruni's India, as it is called in this Northern edition, he basically summarized uh, Hindu beliefs, religious beliefs, Hindu values, culture, he even talked about the games. Uh, he found a very fascinating form of chess, which I will show you that he describes in the book. It is amazing. It has 80 chapters in it. It goes much in detail. But before that, let me very quickly tell you how he calculated uh, the radius of the Earth so accurately. So basically, he conducted this uh, experiment near Nandana Fort. So what he did was he basically needed a, a tall mountain and a flat plain. And he found that uh, in what is today's Pakistan. Uh, and Nandana Fort is the venue and you can see the picture here. So he used the height of the mountain and basically three angles. The angle at which uh, the tangent from the, from, or the extension of the line from the height of the mountain to where it met with the horizon. So that angle, and then he calculated two other angles. He moved away from the mountain. He took an angle to the top of it. Then he measured the distance to, to another point and then measured. So he measured these two angles. And based on that and the height of the mountain, uh, he was able to calculate, and you can see the trigonometric calculations. A lot of people have replicated his experiments. If you go to YouTube and just Google Albiruni and radius of the earth, you will see several such videos, but the best one is the one that was done by BBC, which basically replicated his experiment. And they also got pretty accurate readings uh, using uh, Albiruni's uh, methodology. Uh, this picture that you see is of the Nandana Fort where he conducted uh, the experiment to measure the radius uh, uh, of, uh, of planet Earth. And this picture is one of those iconic pictures that is from his book where Al-Biruni describes the different phases of the moon. Uh, as I said, he translated the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. He, he loved this book. It is very clear from his writing that he was uh, quite impressed by the contents of the book. Um, so I want, before I preface, uh, or talk about his books, I want to preface it with the comments that I found him quite philosophical. I did not really expect it. I, the first time I read Al-Biruni was 20 years ago uh, while I was in grad school. And at that time, I was not very familiar with Islamic philosophy and the debates uh, uh, that uh, kept Muslim philosophers engaged. Now that I know of the debates and the theological debates also between rationalist and traditionalists in the Islamic tradition, uh, I was able to appreciate uh, Al-Biruni's knowledge uh, and familiarity with all of those debates and his profound understanding of those debates. So keep that in mind uh, as we go along that he was philosophical and he was more interested in philosophy. Uh, in his opening of the book, he talks about methods, he talks about why people lie, and so he emphasizes the need to separate uh, falsehood from truth, and essentially talks about his methodology, in which he says very clearly that, look, my goal is to describe things as I see it, and as I find them, I'm not neither here to criticize them nor to praise them, whether you accept them, whether you find them reasonable or not, that's up to you. I'm going to tell the story as I see it. So it was a very interesting, and that is why um, Al-Biruni is also considered uh, the father of anthropology. He was perhaps the first anthropological scholar. I might imagine 13 years of field work and learning the language. And this is what area studies people do here in political science, etc. You learn the language, you go and do field work, and then you come back and write your dissertation. Al-Biruni did the same thing. He learned the language, understood 
uh, read the main books uh, of uh, India, engaged with many of the philosophers. It is very clear that he read Patanjali, he read Samakya, he read the Bhagavad Gita, he read Mahabharata, he read the Vedas and the Puranas and the Upanishads. It's very clear from the book itself where he summarizes some of them, identifies them, lists all the various kind, various Puranas that he encountered. And so it was very clear that he did a very thorough job of his research. But there was clearly this philosophical, he was less social scientific and more philosophical, even though his observations are incredible. And I wanted to keep that in mind. Besides being the father of anthropology, Al-Biruni is also seen as the father of geodesy, which is a science of understanding and studying the planet Earth, its geography, its circumference, etc. Anyway, so the first thing he writes uh, about Hindus uh, is that he talks about their beliefs. He says the Hindus believe with regard to God that he's one, eternal, without beginning and end, acting by free will, almighty, all wise, living, giving life, ruling, preserving. One who in his sovereignty is unique beyond all likeness and unlikeness, and that he does not resemble anything nor does anything resemble him. In order to illustrate this, we shall produce some extracts from their literature, for the less the reader should think that our account is nothing but hearsay. What I found fascinating about this paragraph, that's why I read it, is that for every description of God that he gives, first of all, he sees Hindus believing as monotheists who, who regard that God is one, is eternal. There is, these are all attributes of God that you will find in Quran. God is one. God is eternal. He is Samad. He is without the beginning and the end. He is acting by free will. He is almighty. He is all wise. He is living. He gives life. There are so many uh, uh, names of God which come, Musavir, etc., about him being a creator of. And its sovereignty is al muqtadir It's amazing. And then he says, beyond all likeness and unlikeness, that he does not resemble anything. Laysa ka misli. These are all in the Quran. So when I first read it, I said, what is he trying to do? Is he trying to project the Islamic concept of one God on Hinduism? But then he goes on to say, no, look, this is how they thought of it. And he continues to prove it from the Bhagavad Gita especially. He also says, this is what educated people believe about God. They call him Ishwar, self-sufficing, beneficent, who gives without receiving. They consider the unity of God as absolute. He repeats this in the book. But that everything beside God, which may appear as unity, is really a plurality of things. So I found this very fascinating that he essentially uh, sees Hinduism as a monotheistic religion. But and then he says, look, let's look at the discussions from the Patanjali. And he repeats and translates some of the texts right here. So he says, uh, the student asks the master about God's knowing. He says, his knowing is the same from all eternity forever and ever. This is also a very Islamic concept that there can be no change in God. God does not learn. He knows everything. He always knew everything. Uh, the people says, where does this knowledge come? The master says, his knowing is the same from all eternity forever wow. and ever. So, uh, <laughs> and praise and celebrate him who has spoken the Veda as and was before the Veda. So he talks about God, God and his knowledge. But the main point that he tries to make is he says, there are educated, and he uses the word Ashraf, elite people who are capable of philosophical abstraction, and then there are ordinary people. He says the most essential point of the Hindu world of thought is that which the Brahmins think and believe. So it, he holds the Brahmins in a very high esteem. He says these are the knowledgeable ones, these are the spiritual ones, these are the scholarly ones. So their values and their beliefs of Hinduism is what matters about Hinduism. For they are especially trained for preserving and maintaining their religion. And this is it which we explain the belief of the Brahmins. So it's very clear in saying that when I'm talking about God, I'm talking about what the Brahmins are talking about. And he does acknowledge that, that the ordinary people who are non-Brahmins have a variety of beliefs uh, and practices and 
he does not dwell much to him he values this so much so he talks about the creation and it is very clear that he is very fond of krishna and refers to him as vasudeva and constantly keeps uh, quoting vasudeva from the bhagavad gita from the mahabharat uh, and elsewhere too uh, i'm skipping now and moving to the sixth chapter in which he talks about the different worlds uh that the hindus perceive creation as he says that they they see the world as composed of three lokas three worlds uh he says the higher one is uh, swarloka or paradise the lower one is naga loka or the hell and then you have the madhya loka or manushya loka this is the world where we all live uh and then he does something very interesting where he quotes uh, uh the from the bhagavad gita and says vasudeva uh, and is telling this to arjun i am the universe without a beginning by being born or without an end by dying and he so he's clearly fascinated with the philosophical and the highest uh intellectual way of understanding the existence and the being of god it reminded me a lot about ibn arabi's concept of god as an ocean without a shore uh he talks about the vedas and the puranas and the various literature he does a pretty good job of listing so for example he provides this entire list of the puranas he says the first list is the one that he saw uh and then he says i have only read these one two three puranas and then i found from other people these lists of the puranas so he does a very systematic Uh, documentation of the religious texts uh, uh, the medieval and later muslim scholars are very good at this they call them ferists so they would believe b- build uh, biblio- bib- annotated bibliographies of books that existed during their time so when you read these scholars you know what all books they saw or they thought existed at that time if you remember i showed you the falsafa uh, of ibn tufail uh, that was such an annotated bibliography he points to a very interesting game he, he says uh, the hindus play chess in a very interesting way he says i had never seen this before it's a four person chess and he proceeds uh, to describe uh it and you can see this table that he draws and says this is how they played uh, this is how it, the game starts and this is how they played a four player chess and later on i did some research to reading this because honestly i didn't know about a four player chess uh chess i had lived in india for 25 years never seen it never played it apparently the game is called chaturaji and you can see a photograph of uh of how the chess uh, the chaturaji chess with four players is played as i told you <laughs> uh albiruni was very fond of uh, vasudeva and so he provides a chart and says vasudeva has many names and uh, and he has a name for every month so he says that in this month he's called kesava in the second month he's called narayana in the third month he's called madhava in the fourth govinda in, in the fifth month he's called vishnu and he provides a list of the names uh, and the list of the months uh, i really didn't know this until recently so in my first reading also i probably skipped this chapter so it's that was very interesting that he went to this great lens to document this uh and uh, he talks about astrology hindu astrology there are lots and lots of charts uh and all the different elements of hindu astrology that he describes in great detail um i want to add the note that uh, albiruni did not like astrology he thought it was a speculative and not really a true science he believed in astronomy and he was a great astronomer himself as you can see from the diagram of the phases of the moon that he plotted uh one of the chapters that he addresses is castes and this i think is the ninth chapter in the in the book there are 80 chapters in the book one thing that is very interesting about albiruni is that he's not trying to judge 
uh, Hindus or what he found in their engagement. He learned the language, Sanskrit. He read all the Cree texts. He engaged extensively with philosophers, Hindu teachers, and the Brahmins, and tried to be as, uh, shall we say, uh, honest and truthful in his representation of their views. And whenever he found something that he didn't like, he would try to moderate the impact of his reporting by also saying, look, we also find these problems uh, in our society, in Muslim societies. So when he addresses the caste system, he begins by first talking about how the ancient Iranian empire had caste system. So he says, uh, when Ardashir ben Babak restored the Persian empire, he also restored the classes or castes of the population in the following way. So he says that in the Iranian culture, the Persian culture, there were four castes. The first class were the knights and princes. The second were the monks and the fire priests and the lawyers. The third class, the physicians, astronomers, and other men of science. And the fourth class, the husbands and artisans. So the class system is not exactly like the Hindu system, Hindu or Indian class caste system, but there was a caste system. So he's trying to say, look, this is not something that is unique to Hinduism or India. Uh, in Arabic, it could be al Hind. So, but he says, look, I mean, the hierarchy is different. For example, the monks are higher in the Hindu system than the knights who would be Kshatriyas. Uh, there is, no, I'm not very sure whether the physicians and professionals, or scientists, etc., have a caste of their own, uh, the businessmen, and then people who do ordinary work. So he goes on and identifies, basically, he says, there are five types of people in India. Uh, and he says they are all castes. The castes are called as varna, that is colors. And from a genealogical point of view, they call them jataka or births. And he says so. Basically, there are four castes. And he says the highest caste are the Brahmins, of whom the books of Hindus tell that they were created from the head of a Brahman, Brahman, the one God. And then he says, uh, the next caste is the Kshatriyas, and they are created from the shoulders and hands of Brahman. Then he says, after them follow the Vaisyas, who are created from the thigh of Brahman, and the Shudras, who were created from his feet. And then he identifies another group of people called Antyaja. He says, these are people who are outcasts. They're not allowed to live in the same city. And it's very interesting in his description of the four castes, not the fifth one, which would be Dalits and Shudra, uh, Dalits and the untouchables, really. He says they, they were not allowed to live in the town. They lived outside and they did menial work, uh, basically cleaning toilets and stuff like that. But of the other four castes, he says they mixed together, they ate together, they even married together. That was an interesting thing that he, he felt the need to identify. And then, of course, uh, he also, like I said, he is quite fond of uh, of uh, Krishna and Vasudeva. And so he goes back to the Bhagavad Gita and, and explains the Indian caste system uh, based on how uh, basically Vasudeva explains it to Arjuna. And it's very interesting as to how, in the point apparently, Vasudeva was trying to make to Arjun was, that if you fulfill your caste profile, like what is expected of you as a Brahman to, to become spiritual, to get religious knowledge, to preserve religious knowledge, to share religious knowledge, to Kshatriya, to be brave, to fight, to defend. He says, if you fulfill what is expected of you based on your caste, then you will find happiness and you will rise uh, so that was uh, a very interesting. Apparently, he found that interesting enough to to repeat in his book. So, Al Biruni's book is fascinating. I only shared four or five chapters and its contents with you. Uh, some of them I may not be interested. Some of them you might be interested. So go through it. It's, it's encyclopedic. It's like Ibn Khaldun's Muqaddima and his uh, history of the world. Uh, and uh, so, so get a copy of Al-Biruni's India. Um, 
I mean, this is an old copy and uh, it's not very easy to read. So there are less expensive uh, electronic digital ver versions on Amazon, which is what I downloaded. And so you have seen the screenshots uh, of Alberino's ideas that I took from the digital version. So, so do read the book, especially if you are from India or if you are in India, or if you're going to India, visiting India, curious about India, this is a fascinating book uh, written by a person who had <laughs> never lived in India uh, and spent 13 years. It's also very interesting that once he got back, uh, he lived after that in uh, mostly in Western Afghanistan, what is today Western Afghanistan. And uh, he did not embark on any other anthropological exercise beyond this. Uh, he came back to science uh, and mathematics. And so basically, I think at the core, he was a, a philosopher slash mathematician slash interested in geometry, understanding uh, the earth. It is also, uh, I, I, I couldn't find the passage, but I remember it as to how while coming to India, he, he immediately realized that mountains, the Himalayas, and the entire Indian subcontinent was perhaps once submerged uh, underwater and was perhaps under an ocean. So it's a pity that uh, for, a, for some centuries, his work was not very well known, but now it's widely known. Uh, and uh, the British actually uh, uh, did a good job of making Al-Biruni's work known. In. So I hope you found today's discussion useful. Please see if you can get a hold of Al-Biruni's India and, and browse through it, if not read it. Uh, so I hope you found this very interesting. So don't forget to subscribe to Conversations, like this video, press this bell icon, don't forget to share with it. So well, this ends my Ramadan 2024 uh, special series uh, on uh, classic books from the Islamic civilization. Uh, I perhaps will continue this even during uh, the non-Ramadan month or maybe again come back to it. There are so many other books I would love to share with you. Uh, and uh, I hope you found this interesting. I might also do some classics from uh, the Indian uh, civilization. I have already done uh, Atasastra uh, by Chanakya or Kautilya. Uh, and I've done that both in Hindi and English. Uh, so do take a look at it uh, if you like. Uh, so thank you very much for watching. Uh, thank you to ICCL for uh, co-hosting this and thank you to the two Khans for supporting it uh, and until next time I'm your host Mukhtadar Khan Eid Mubarak